Welcome to the Capital City Crew Podcast. Join your hosts Jeff, Owen, Josh, and Herman as they dive deep into the game of Malifaux. Explore sophisticated strategies and creative combinations, but always remember in Malifaux, bad things happen. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Capital City Group Podcast. Today, I am joined in studio with Herman and Jeff. Josh will be back next time, uh, but today we will be hearing all about Jeff's favorite stinkiest lady, uh, the queen of the penetrating stench and the swamp, Zoraida. So, uh, but before we get into that, we are going to do a new segment that we call Speed Strats. Uh, And if you have a better name to suggest, let us know and we might adopt it on the show. But here's the premise of the segment. We will generate a scheme pool, uh, a, a strategy, a deployment, and a set of schemes right at the start of the uh, of the recording. And we'll have a few minutes to look at it. Uh, and then we will have to reveal what would our picks be going into that, not knowing what our opponent's faction or, or crew is, but what would we bring to the table uh, in that speed decision? This is a good way to simulate what would you do at a table if you showed up either for a game night or a tournament? Uh, so with that, without further ado, we're going to jump straight into it. So the randomly decided mission that we generated was to wedge, break the line, vendetta, assassinate, claim jump, breakthrough, deathbeds. So we've just taken a couple minutes to put together some crews and we are ready to reveal those. And we're going to start things off with me. Uh, so playing Outcast, um, I'm currently on a Von Schill kick. And I will preface this by saying uh, this is definitely biased by just you know what I'm currently into. But here's a couple of reasons why I think Von Schill could be good into this pool. The crew that I would probably bring to the table in a in this matchup would be two scouts, Eric, Hannah, librarian in the Midnight Stalker. So why that? Well, the scouts bring from the shadows. So from the shadows is automatically going to give me options to try to either get some early positioning to break the line or set those scouts up to potentially do breakthrough or just put them in useful positions to head off my opponent. Um, It also helps with mitigating terrain and other potential um, issues that might come up around concealing. Meanwhile, Eric and Hannah can be a nice brick in the center. So have options for potentially going for claim jump or uh, they're fairly beefy. So they, they could withstand some, uh, potential vendetta counterplay. So my probable picks of schemes in this would be breakthrough, since I have access to the uh, the boots that give leap, as well as the midnight stalker, and then maybe vendetta with a scout, uh, or possible audible into claim jump, or honestly assassinate or deathbeds, because this crew can put out a variety of types of markers. Um, So there's really a lot of options here. Um, And this crew is not super vulnerable itself to assassinate. So those are my picks. Let's go to Herman. All right. So for this, I actually decided to reach uh, back to 2020 and go with Dashiell. So my crew is Dashiell with four soul stones, a leadline sock, a dispatcher, two mounted guards, a guild steward, a guild lawyer, rifleman, and Dr. Grimwell. So what I liked about this going into Dashiell is uh, specifically have this wedge deployment. So you're going to be starting relatively close to each other. And when you have a summoner like Dashiell, what you're looking to do is make an executioner, make a warden or two, and jam it into your opponent's face and just keep jamming it and jamming it and jamming it. And that makes it very difficult because they have to eat through that extra model before they can start spreading out, before they can start doing their own um, break the line. On the other hand, you've got the two mounted guards. You have a lot of mobility there with Ride With Me and Speed. You have Dr. Grumwell as well. So you already have these models who can spread out a little bit. They can cover these various markers. They can move them around. 
So you're summoning a model, pushing it into your opponent's face. You have the rifleman. He can do your vendetta if you want. You have a little bit of kind of slop points between the rifleman, and Dr. Gwimwell, where if you want to take in someone who's a little tankier, so you kind of, you're not relying on just that first execution or summon, you can take another kind of tank and shove them up into your opponent's face, you know, early on in turn one. So that way you have two models kind of going in there. But the idea is to really pin them back while you're doing your own thing, control that center of the board, control the territory. Uh, so I'm looking at this as breakthrough, particularly with the Mounted Guard and Grimwell, fairly easy. Uh, Vendetta, Rifleman's very cheap, uh, very easy. Then you're going to have some executioners to kind of back him up. Uh, claim Jump, you don't put it on anything you summon, but the executioners themselves have scatter, so they can actually move models out of that uh, center area. And then Deathbeds, um, you remove corpse markers with your crew. So if your opponent does choose corpse markers as their deathbed marker, you're actually kind of removing that. Dashiell himself removes ski markers to summon off of. So you're kind of covering two different marker, marker denial there um, as well going into this. And then finally, the deadline sock on Dashiell is because he is relatively prone for assassinate points, unfortunately. All right. And for my pick in this, uh, oddly enough, uh, this was a randomly generated scheme. We literally clicked the random button a couple of times until uh, we told Owen to stop. And it just so happened that the Zoraida episode, I picked Zoraida on. Um, but it's not uh, without merit. Um, first of all... It's got Zoraida right, on the brain. Uh, yeah. But uh, just this pool screams for Zoraida. Uh, but from break the line alone, uh, between her obeys and her fast crew, uh, she can get extra actions out of models that are near uh, near a marker, uh, a strategy marker. Uh, on top of that, uh, if a model moves itself into place and uh, say something like a Salora jumps to a strategy marker and pushes it, uh, she can then activate and do the double obey on that same uh, Salord to make it move into the uh, strategy marker and move it again. So uh, she's just all around amaz- amazing uh, for uh, break the line uh, for the schemes. Um, I would, uh, oh, I should go through the full cr- uh, crew. Zoraida, Bad Juju, the Groot Slang, uh, Vasilisa, and a- Adzi, AIDS, however you want to pronounce it, and two Salords. Uh, claim jump uh, would be my first uh, pick using either Juju or the Groot Slang. Uh, Juju, because he's a really hard thing to move uh, whenever he gets into place, uh, particularly with Zoraida's support, or the Groot Slang. If you think your opponent is going to go hard after Juju, you can do a surprise uh, Groot Slang moving into place to get the claim jump. And Breakthrough, because Lords are literally made for things like Breakthrough. Uh, they're very fast. You can't hit them unless you're close to them, and you can keep them away from uh, uh, models uh, between that and their butterfly jump, they're very hard to take out. Uh, but this crew also gives you the option of audibling into assassinate if you're going against a master that's uh, somewhat easier to kill. Uh, I'll go into details on how Zoraida can do the, that fairly easily, easily later in this episode, but uh, she can audible to assassinate or deathbeds uh, where you have the Groot slang uh, that is putting out markers uh, and you can choose that as your marker along with a scheme marker and quite literally obey the enemy that you want over into your marker zone uh, whenever you want to kill it. So uh, she's excellent in the scheme pool and in general, she can accomplish most schemes, but we'll get to that in the rest of the episode. So what do you guys think of each other's picks? Um, I think overall of y'all's picks, um, Dashiell, I find, is always good. We're going to learn all about why Zoraida might be awesome here. Uh, what do you all think? I think Dashiell, between the two picks, uh, with the crew that I picked, Dashiell would be the harder uh, opponent to go against. Um I would have to uh, utilize what I call the uh, the puppet factory uh, with Vasilisa to make uh, hardy puppets to send against uh, Dashiell's summoning, uh, but that's not a huge problem. Uh, I would I think I'd have advantage over Von Schill uh, because with a lot of his ranged uh, crew and a lot of the crew, particularly the key pieces that I'm using, either be in. Uh, concealment or you can't target them due to stealth. Uh, I think the, the Zoraida would get the edge over Von Schill in this encounter. So funnily enough, that's where the scouts can help by nullifying the concealment and then you hope for that the Willpower 7, Hannah um, potentially the uh, 
Actually, so against the red eye, I wonder if there could be a case made for Lazarus so you couldn't move him around or mess with him. Although that might be better used for um, the uh, turf war. But but yeah, I think overall Dashiell is going to have an easier time being able to summon chaff, throwing it out there. Um, yeah, and I think that's even though they made the changes to summoning for scoring perspective, this kind of highlights, particularly with that wedge deployment, where he can just get shit up into your face quickly. It highlights where summoners still maintain that power, where they can jam up your crew and they can waste your time with you know models that realistically the models aren't going to score. No one really cares about them. Oh no, sir! Everybody cares about a stitched. <laughs> I mean, that's true. They are they are quite annoying. Uh, all right, so there you have it. That's our speed strat segment. Let us know what you think, and uh, if y'all like it, we will put this into the rotation every now and then. All right. And so with that, we're going to go to a quick break and we'll be back with our main topic for today's episode, which is all about Zoraida and the Swamp Fiend keyword. All right. Welcome back. And we are going to talk for the rest of the show about Zoraida, the Curious and actually really interesting character if you're into the lore of Malfa. So Zoraida is a human who comports with the Neverborn in the swamp. She came to Malifo, uh sometime in the past through a magical portal and now is involved in some sort of activities related to the fates and preventing or helping or somehow dealing with the tyrants. So she's actually a really fascinating character. So if you're into the lore, do go read about her. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in the M2 eBooks, uh, the M3 eBooks. So lots of cool stuff, but I really we, appreciate how you provided no information on her background whatsoever there. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> Would you like to, to chime in with some background? No, I have no idea what she does. <laughs> it's just she does something nefarious at some point in the past. And, and I actually can't. Um, she's actually human-ish. Uh, she's like hundreds of years old now. Uh, when she got to Malifo, she's more than just a human at this point. But the, well, an interesting thing is in one of the books, how she got to Malifo, uh, she actually goes back in time uh, with the help of Lilith and Pandora in order to ensure the events happen to set her on the path to put herself into Malifo. Uh, so that's actually one of the most fascinating stories of uh, something happened. I'm not going to spoil any of the stories, but something happens that when Zoraida was a child, she put herself on this path to researching uh, magic and lore and getting into Malifo that would eventually, you know, she would become part of Malifo. But there is some grand cataclysmic event that Zoraida knows about uh, that she that she's basically preparing all of Malifo for, and she had to ensure that she was part of this along the whole way. So she goes back in time and causes a tragedy to herself as a child in order to ensure that she's there for this cataclysmic event that's supposed to come. So it's it's a fascinating story. You should go back and read it. I wish I could uh, tell you which book it was in, uh, but it's a it's a really good read. This sounds suspiciously like the plot to Back to the Future 2. I want to say that it is the third book from second edition. Um, I don't recall the title of that, but I'm pretty sure that that's the book that I happens. I think you in. might be correct, because uh, this fourth book was introducing Titania, and uh, correct. Lilith was then thrown into where she got thrown into, and she yeah. wasn't a factor anymore. So you're probably correct. Yeah, so it was pre, pre-Titania. pre uh, Although Titania is now totally screwed up her plans. Um, but anyways, we are not actually a lore podcast. Um, there are some great lore podcasts out there. We do recommend you check them out. There's the Breach Side Broadcast. Um, the uh, Scoundrel, the... The Schemes and Scoundrels, right? Yep, Schemes and Scoundrels. Yep, shout out to them. Um, so yeah, do check those out. The People don't, well, some people are into it, but not everyone knows. There's actually a lot of really awesome lore um, behind Malifa that's been built up over the years. So do check it out. But we are not a lore podcast. We are a competitive gaming podcast. So we're going to talk about and hear from Jeff why he loves 
Zaretta. And unlike some of our other recent uh, podcasts, we're not going to spend 10 minutes talking about why she sucks and then we came to love her. Um, instead, Jeff is just going to give us the sales pitch. Why should you come play Zoraida? So Zoraida herself, uh, there's a couple of reasons why you want to play Zoraida. First of all, she has a master as a toolbox. She has the tools needed in any given situation where your master will never stand around doing nothing, uh, which is excellent. Uh, in some cases, you may uh, get a uh, lady justice that's stuck behind a wall where coming out will be a little disadv- uh, disadvantageous to you. Uh, but Zoraida never has to deal with that. She always has something that she can do with her actions and all of her AP is extremely valuable. Um, aside from that, uh, she has a lot of variety in her keyword and she can hire different models depending on the play style that you want to play. And that by itself is awesome. And the fact that she is so versatile, uh, she can be bring brought into basically any strat and scheme pool and do well. She is one of the masters, uh, the few masters in Malifaux that I think you can take to an event and solo her and expect to uh, be on the top podium uh, with all an all comers list. Like uh, she is uh, one of the, in my opinion, one of the best masters in all of Malifaux. Uh, and it's just going to take time for people to uh, really d- get down into the depths of how good she can be. So why don't you tell us about a couple of the different play styles that you you like to do with Zoraida? So right off the bat, uh, I mentioned before uh, about a puppet factory. Uh, the puppet factory involves bringing either Vasilisa or Widow Weaver. And the reason why is uh, your voodoo doll uh, that... Uh, Zoraida is one of the unique masters and she doesn't actually get her totem when she starts, but the voodoo doll becomes a card cycle on this where when you bring the voodoo doll out, you get ditch a low card at the end of Zoraida's turn to bring the voodoo doll in. When the voodoo doll activates, it's going to do whatever it needs to do in its turn and then sacrifice itself to uh, provide that card cycle. When it dies, you draw a card and then Vasilisa or Widow Weaver uh, will then raise a puppet from that scrap marker that's created, uh, which uh, you know, usually want to lean towards a, a stitch together or something uh, that's needed uh, for whatever you have at that time. Uh, so that's kind of how the puppet factory works. Herman? So one question that comes up is, you know, part of making that voodoo doll is that it's supposed to give you this ability to control and interact with your opponent, whichever model you attach the curse onto. Is it more efficient to use the voodoo doll for this summon factory than it is to actually use it for its intended purpose? That depends on uh, who you're playing against. And I'm glad you brought this up. I was going to mention this later. One of the first things that you're going to do when you're playing Zoraida is you're going to look at your enemy's list as soon as you can see what the list is. Because you need to know everything that your opponent can do, uh, not just for Zoraida's obey actions, but also because the Voodoo Doll can use one of the actions of... uh, of the thing that it's hemmed to, and it automatically hems something within 12 inches of Zoraida when it's spawned, not of itself, but of Zoraida. Um, and the reason why it's at a negative two stat and you can't summon things with it, but you need to know all of the abilities to know the proper uh, models that you want to hem and the proper models that you want to attempt to obey. Uh, and it's very important that you know the other crew that you're going against. And I think that's one of the reasons why Zoraida is not played as often, uh, even though I consider her to be one of the strongest masters, is because you have to also know other crews to know what toolbox that you can use uh, in any given situation. And it will change based on the game that you're playing against. I don't know if that answered your question that you had, but uh, uh, the, an- the actual answer to your question is it depends on the crew that you're going against, whether or not you want to use the puppet factory or you want to use the uh, uh, the voodoo doll itself for the benefits that it brings. That makes sense. So let, let's talk about, and, and we're not going to go through every card, like as usual, we're not going to go through everything individually, but let's talk a little bit about her own key abilities like what is what is happening for you on like when you activate Zoraida like what's your focus once again this is entirely dependent upon your street schemes and strats and what you're trying to accomplish in that game and 
I, I know that sounds a little vague, but without knowing who I'm going against, it's hard to tell you uh, what you're doing. But just based on the strat that we did earlier, the reason why I said that you can audible into assassinate based on their master, uh, she's got an ability, Poisoned Fate. You can read the card to find out what it does. does. But in a nutshell is when uh, a model cheats fate, they suffer two damage. So if you have a master that's less hardy, you can put Poisoned Fate on it and then throw models at it, and that model has to uh, make a choice of, am I going to stop this large thing that's going to hit me, or am I going to try to cheat fate, suffer two damage, and still potentially have my opponent also hit me on top of that. Uh, so wh- if you get Poison Fate onto an enemy master, uh, and Zoraida can do, do that from a range of about six, 18 inches away, um, it, makes, it makes that master really difficult to use. Uh, and the reason why it's so beautiful and how this works is let's throw out there, not the best choice, but if you're going against a dreamer and you are, you're able to put poison fate on him, uh, anytime that he cheats fate. So when he goes to summon and he cheats fate in order to get that summon out, he takes two points of damage. Like that it, it's a, an underused ability. That's probably one of the best abilities that you can have on a card. So it's interesting you call it the Dreamer specifically because that's not an attack. So I believe that'll get around to incorporeal as well. That is correct. It's uh, it, it's a little ambiguous because it, it's it's not a condition. I I don't really know how this would be classified. It just puts a status on the person where if they take an, uh, an action uh, that resolves in which they uh, cheated fate. Uh, it's so it's. It's an interesting mechanic of how that works. Fair enough. Um, so yeah, so it's interesting though, because so you're saying you're telling me, I guess, um, that Zoraida is one of your favorite masters, and I'm assuming from a Neverborn perspective. Um, Correct. I, I don't play by you because they smell bad. Uh, I mean, arguably, she has a penetrating stench as well. Yeah, but they're, they're 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 short people that smell bad. Um, so, but, so where, where do you think Zoraida, I guess if Zoraida is so high up the list in your opinion, um, and maybe we come back to this after we talk about the crew and and what else is happening, but I think the thing to keep in mind is I'm interested in what your thoughts are on why maybe Zoraida is underplayed or undervalued in the Neverborn faction. Um, I was just looking up the stats uh, for the Malfa World Series. Um, she did see a lot of play uh, in some of the early rounds, so in the November round. Um, but since gaining grounds two, she's only seen like middling um, appearances. Uh, there were four total games in the, in the May event. Um, so she's definitely not as played as... Nakima, who we heard about in a, in a recent episode, um, and Pandora. So I'm curious why you might think that is, um, and what are people missing when it comes to Zoraida? So I think the big thing, the big reason why Zoraida isn't played as much is, uh, number one, uh, she's not a new master. Uh, she's been around for a very long time. Uh, and people tend to gravitate towards new things. When Titania came out, everyone wanted to play Titania, and Titania now has new fun things like the Malasaurus Rex. Uh, Nakima is a very uh, straightforward master where uh, you can see what she does, you know what she does, and she's very good at it. Uh, Zoraida is not very straightforward in what she does, and the way she goes about doing things is... uh, you have to look at things, uh, number one, your enemy crew, as I mentioned, but number two, your strats and schemes and how you're going to utilize her toolbox. Just going through, uh, and I'll just highlight a couple of strategies with some of her abilities. Reading the cards is something that everybody overlooks, uh, including myself. I forget about it a lot, and I've played Zoraida a lot. But when some an enemy model uh, cheats fate, uh, you get to look at the top card of their fate deck and then have them discard it if you choose. Uh, which is insanely powerful. And the fact that people just forget about this is just right off the bat, insanely good. Uh, Like it's one of the few, the things that makes her really good. Um, But 
everyone knows about Rise in the Night. I'm not going to re- re- review it. They had to nerf it because it was a little too powerful where you could stand behind things uh, and not have the aura to it. Um, but if you notice between both Voodoo, uh, Voodoo Pins and Hex, she puts out Injured. Injured is an insanely good uh, uh, condition in this game uh, to the point where some masters solely focus around Injured. But her Hex also has uh, a combined where she can heal models uh, around that uh, that model with a trigger or she can make one of her models attack you. Or uh, I mean, that alone is uh, an outstanding ability, but I don't use Hex near as much as Obey or Poison Fate. Uh, and we already touched on Poison Fate. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk more about Obey's later uh, in the podcast because uh, Obey is one of the best abilities in the game if you know your opponent's crew and you know how to use them. Just right off the bat, I can tell you of a situation where uh, when somebody takes a rider, uh, it is, and they move the rider into place and they're wanting to use it and you obey them with ensorcel where you get to make two actions with them. You can run that rider back into their deployment zone, completely out of position. And you've used one AP to negate two AP that the opponent has used. Uh, and when you look at AP from a, a standpoint of it being a resource, you uh, you, you're gaining a positive gain there regardless because you're utilizing one master AP to undo some, an entire model's activation. Which, well, and one thing on the rider specifically is that she can use all of their tokens. Yes, uh, and, and we've mentioned that. Uh, we, I, I believe it was uh, Landon that was on here that mentioned that when you're going against the right, uh, if you have a rider and you have tokens on it, you should use all of your tokens and the defense against Obey because uh, Zoraida is going to use your tokens to do really bad things to you. Uh, so that's a, a, a nice little tip for you there. Uh, but along with her ba- Obey, she also has the burnout trigger where she can do two damage to something and give it fast. So not only are you gaining an AP, you're also generating an additional AP with the fast, uh, which makes her obey literally one of the best moves in the entire game. It is the action efficiency of it is just insane. Well, and, and you can use it to kill something too. Honestly, like you could you could also do damage. You, you can do damage with it, but uh, there's if you're just looking for the two damage, uh, her hex is a minimum of two, uh, and the obey you're losing out on the actual obey action because they'll take the two damage and then just die. So, so uh, the fun interaction with that actually came up once against Archie because he has numb skull, so he cannot gain fast, but he does enjoy that two damage and obey. That's interestingly and f- interesting and fun. Um. The last thing I'll talk about with Zoraida is when to know uh, when you should use Threads of Fate and when you shouldn't. If you're activating Zoraida towards the beginning of your turn... So can you just tell our listeners what is Threads of Fate? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, they can look at the card, but uh, Threads of Fate takes takes no cards for you to use. There's no target number. It just goes off as a bonus action where both players discard their control hands and draw six cards. Uh, And this is one of those things where uh, you read your opponent if your opponent's drawing their cards and the look on their face isn't very good, well, you're probably not going to want to use Threads of Fate. Uh, the other thing is if your opponent has decided, you know, they have a lot of soul stones, but they chose not to soul stone when they're drawing cards, probably means that they have a pretty good hand to start out with. You might want to get rid of that hand for them. But one of the fun things to do is uh, you'll when you have somebody that hasn't played Zoraida before, usually in the first turn when Zoraida's uh, going on the offensive against them, uh, they will hold their high cards, and at the end of that, uh, her activation, you use Threads of Fate to have them get rid of all their cards. You've used all of your high cards, and you're good to go. You, you, everyone has a fresh hand, and it's like her action didn't take any cards from your hand. During the second turn, uh, they're going to get smart to this, and they're going to think about this and say, okay, I'm going to use all of my high cards because Zoraida is just going to make me get rid of them. Well, in the second turn, you use your middling cards to uh, get their high cards out. Then you do not use Threads of Fate because now they've used all of their high cards and you still have yours. So you are completely in control over you and your opponent's uh, hands, and it's up to you when you want to use Threads of Fate and when you shouldn't. It is it is a, a super annoying ability to be on the other side of the table with. But on the flip side, if you want to be clever and you draw a really crappy hand, uh, act as though you have an awesome hand 
and hope that Zoraida will try to bin it and you'll be like, lols, here's all my low cards. Let me at least get another try. Um, but I don't know. Herman, what do you think? So it's something that'll affect how you build your list when you know you're going up into Zoraida is make sure that you're including card draw and card cycling. So that way you can kind of overcome that. And then what I typically do is if it's Zoraida's activation, I will use all but like one of my good cards. So that way, if she doesn't do it, I still have a good card. And if she does do it, I only lose one card. So it's kind of mitigating a little bit that pain. And then again, you bring in that card cycling to help offset it a little bit as well. And this goes to kind of the, the countering Zoraida. Um, just know uh, and plan in your, into your game plan, you are going to get obeyed. Uh, she's a stat seven on this. And most of the time uh, when you're cheating in high, you are probably still going to get obeyed. So just be aware of that uh, because of her high stat on that. And uh, it's not a good idea to waste your cards uh, trying to stop something that will probably go through regardless. Uh, I just realized we didn't uh, talk about the other uh, ways of uh, making her crew uh, after the puppet factory. Um, which kind of leads directly into list building, uh, I, I would assume. Uh, she has an insane keyword uh, and the things that she can bring between uh, the spawn mother, bad juju, McTavish, the first mate. Uh, I mean, she has what, how many? 5, 10, 11, 12, 13, 13 models that she can bring in keyword. Um, a lot of people love the Go Trooper cores. Uh, I am not a t- particularly a fan of it because I'm more, I, I'm more of a Neverborn player. They have their. They place. are really good, though. They They're... are very, very good. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not discounting that. I just. Uh, yeah, I'm it's... not a fan of playing against them. <laughs> uh, they, they do card cycling, but to me, I've never, and I know some Bayou players are screaming right now. I've never seen the need for Zoraida to need more card cycling. Uh, the healing is nice for them, uh, but. Uh, it, it, it is one of the ways that you can play where you can get basically complete hand domination between the go Trooper core uh, and they provide another avenue of obeys. Um, to me, that's kind of compounding the thing that she already does really well and trying to make it to where she does it insanely good, uh, where I more prefer, uh, as I mentioned, the puppet factory. But if you notice a lot of her keyword, uh, the second uh, thing that, and a lot of Bayou players do play with the Go Trooper core, but that's because the, her keyword has a lot of damage tracks that are things like two, three, five or two, four, five, like where there's huge damage jumps. Uh, and what I like to do when I'm playing in a high damage game uh, where I want to pump out uh, lots of attacks that actually matter is I'll bring in the black blood shaman. Uh, and have him pulse out focus so that when my models are hitting, they're hitting at, uh, at, at, at their peak uh, to where I'm getting those those fours and those fives with every hit. Uh, and then the Black Blood Shaman inevitably turns into a mature Nephilim that gives me another massive beater uh, that she can uh, use. It has regeneration where she can cause it to uh, take damage and get, give it fast later uh, in the later three turns, three, four, or five. Um, so that's the second one. And the last one, uh, Neverborn in general have a problem with scheme runners, uh, and Zoraida is a good pick to bring into that because the Lords are one of the best scheme runners in the game. Uh, between their stealth and their leap, uh, they can move a massive distance on the board and can do it in relative sla- safety due to stealth and butterfly jump. So uh, the, those are kind of the, the three main ways, uh, well, four counting the uh, Go Trooper Core. And you can mix and match these because if, uh, if you noticed... Puppet Factory, I only mentioned one model that you need to bring uh, in order to get that to, to go off. Um, for the high damage, you're bringing in something that can uh, generate focus. For scheme running, you're bringing Solorids. Uh, and the list that I gave you earlier uh, in the uh, speed strats uh, tech that we went over, um, is that is that a good name? Are we, are we Listeners, give us a good, a good name for this. That is what we called it, though, speed strats. Uh, it, it is. Uh, but if you notice, uh, I included Vasilisa and the Salords, so I'm actually doing both the Puppet Factory and Scheme Running uh, with this. So uh, it's very versatile and very powerful. Okay. Um, so, all right. So if I heard you correctly, just to recap, we've got uh, the Puppet Factory. So being able to generate a bunch of puppets, uh, get those out, do some summoning. We've got the 
pick pick your favorite high damage models and obey them to do even more damage and get free charges and do nasty shenanigans. Uh, we've got the have a bunch of schemers and for never born players, bring in those Silurids who are really good and plug a hole of missing scheme runners. Um, and then it's just the general sort of disruption tech that they do. Uh, is that right? That's a good summary. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's, uh, I don't want to delve deep into every model that they have yeah. uh, that she can bring along. Uh, Cause you know, everyone can read the cards and see what they do. I will say a mistake. Uh, Will-O-Wisps are great models. And well, why they, don't we, why don't we save the, uh, the list building for when we come back for a quick break? Oh, that's a great idea. All right. So, um, so yeah, so there, there you have like the general premise. We're going to go to a quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk a little bit about models uh, that might flesh out your crew and what either, well, what Jeff's core list is. Um, Herman's going to tell us a little bit about what he sees from his regular Bayou opponent in terms of core lists. And uh, we'll talk about the options there. So stick with us. We'll be right back. Hello. Do you like our podcast and want to ensure that it continues to run? Maybe you want to hear our outtakes on unedited footage. Or perhaps you're just flush with cash and you like being generous. Either way, we've set up a Patreon just for you. If you like us, please consider donating. Our Patreon can be located in the show notes. If not, we're all pretty sure that it's Herman's fault. Either way, if you like our show, go ahead and leave us a comment. Thanks. Alrighty, folks. Welcome back. So we are going to take this next segment to talk about crew building models. What are your core choices? What are your never takes? Uh, and what are your audible choices? Um, so first off, we just have to say, my goodness, the swamp fiend keyword with 12 models, not including the master, uh, and the totem. That is a very large pool of possible models. Um, I don't, I don't actually know off the top of my head what the if that is the biggest pool, but it certainly is larger than a lot of the keyword pools out there. So you've got a lot of options. Um, so tell us, Jeff, in in Neverborn, your preferred faction, who are your winners? Who are your losers? Who are your maybes? Um, just quickly going through it. So uh, some of these are going to be a little controversial. Um, the first one that I really like, uh, this is going to be no surprise to anyone, particularly because he just got a really good model uh, model itself, uh, Bad Juju. And one of the big things that Bad Juju brings to the table, aside from his demise ability, uh, he is not the most hardy model because he has really low defense, but his quicksand trigger that he has uh, is insanely good. Uh, the Being able to pulse out uh, slow... Uh, on a really high uh, test is really, really good. Um, and, you know, his damage track is great, and he, him being able to remove conditions is good. But that quicksand trigger, I can't tell you how valuable that is in a game. Herman? Massively disagree. I want to think his model looks like crap. Because it's a <laughs> terrible looking model. <laughs> I'm sorry to whoever sculpted that. I know a lot of work goes into sculpting models, but it looks like they took a dump on a base. Are, are you and talking I, about the new one or the the old one? The one where they like have like a boat stuck onto it. Yeah, that's the new one. Yeah, it's like I, a little kid I, I, ate a boat and then took a dump. I don't. I'm gonna uh, do a shout out to the dude that did the uh, horrific uh, red growths all over Bad Juju that he did the full painting. Uh, uh, where he actually like did all the steps of how he painted it. His, that model looks amazing. That's it. You're like, this model looks amazing because we gave it a diaper rash. Oh, okay. So, oh, so wow. yeah, yeah, I actually haven't. Oh man. I had not really looked at the new sculpt. What? It has a boat in its back. That is really weird. It does have a boat in its back. It and makes the new, so the much new voodoo sense. doll looks really good too, in my opinion. Well, I mean, but, I guess it's like he's, it's, Emerging out of the swamp, and it's he's like a swamp monster. Um, they could Would have you made say that him he's look, a swamp fiend, <laughs> right? A swamp fiend. They could have made him look like um, that. Was it swamp 
Is it Swamp Thing? Is that the the superhero? I yeah, think it's more it's, the Silurids are like him. No, yeah. the Swamp Thing thing kind of looked like his uh, M2E model, where it yeah. kind of looks like a piece of the swamp that's right. But anyways, there. no, we're, yes. this is not an aesthetic <laughs> podcast, Herman. Tell us, tell us. No, I mean, the defense, the defense three is absolutely crippling. It's totally crippling. Like you can just have your way with this guy, and it's perfectly fine. Or, you know, like, hey, I don't want to deal with regeneration and demise eternal, so I'll just jam him with a model, and he's got freaking two swings. I mean, I love Quicksand. Quicksand does a great trigger, but he's just too crippled by the low defense. Would you consider him into a keyword that relies on willpower attacks? Because he does have willpower seven, which is bananas. I mean, you can, but that's... That's not commonplace enough, I think, to really happen. Did you, did you really just say that he has two swings? Yeah. Because, um, no, that's not correct at all. As a matter of fact, uh, usually he's going to get four in a turn. Uh, just, just Any that, that right model with her gets an extra two. Hinamatsu comes with six swings on her own and then an extra two from Zoraida. He has two swings. When it's the same freaking extra two for any single model you pick, it doesn't count as an extra two. Um, except uh, you can use the burnout trigger on him and he has regeneration so he negates the two damage that he takes. And uh, Hinamatsu doesn't have a damage track of three, four, six with a two inch range. So I'm going to go ahead and take your objection and tell you that you're overruled and move on. I think okay, we might I mean, have, to have a Zoraida off. We played this game. I stuck a freaking <laughs> Pistolero on him, and he just sat there with it all game. He accomplished jack shit last time we played. There are, and then the last time we that. played Zoraida, you didn't even bother to take him. So, so don't get off the high horse. He's not that great. Oh, Bad Juju is a, is a very good model. Um, I mean. Remember, you cannot spell I, bad juju without bad. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to. Well, not that my vote necessarily counts here, but I, I think I might have to side with Herman. Not a hundred percent, but the defense three is is pretty rough. Um, he does have regen, which is good. He does have hard to wound, which helps a little bit, uh, and demise eternals, right? So, like, he's got. He's not just gonna like fall over and die, but. Defense three is is pretty tough. Um, but with that said, uh, I would love to hear from our listeners as to whether they think bad juju, good or bad. Um, but anyways, continue. Um, Jeff, bad juju. You're like, yes, I love him. Who else do you love? Uh, obviously, uh, I've already talked about uh, Vasilisa and um, Widow Weaver. Uh, not both, but just one of them to help bring out uh, things like Stitched. Uh, this one is the one that is going to be what I think is going to be controversial, controversial. I actually really like the ads aids, uh, however they're, uh, you want to pronounce their name. Ads. Uh, aid, aid, yeah, whatever. Uh, other than the lore, which we all know how good the lore is, uh, this model can reliably put burning onto more or less anything that it wants. And uh, once it has burning on things, it gains positive flips to everything uh, that happens between it and that model uh, due to the like a moth to the flame ability. Um, and even though uh, the uh, AIDS, ad, ADZ, whatever, uh, is a little more on the fragile side, it is incredibly fast at move seven. Uh, and its venomous strike will be uh, hitting. It heals every time that it hits with a stat six. It's going to hit fairly often and does minimum two while adding poison and gaining the same amount of life back. Um, I like this model, and people don't expect they they kind of look a little strange for a minute when uh, the ads is put on the table. Uh, but whenever they see it fly into the middle of a group of clumped up. Uh, 
uh, models and it puts out burning to everything around it and then starts making free melee attacks for, from doing that at plus, plus flips. Uh, I like the model a lot. And it's uh, if you are playing against a melee crew, it works uh, really well because they try to come in on the, the aids to stop it and it's shimmering lights automatically gives it distracted for coming in on it. Uh, so uh, I, between both Zoraida and Marcus, I think the aids is a, a good pick. Go ahead, uh, Herman or let me, Owen. Yeah, let me just jump in before Herman either blasts your pick or agrees with your pick. Um, I will just throw in not a comment about lures, but a comment about lures, uh, which is that I, I think this is a good example where Weird has really mined a lot of world folklore for things. The the Adzi or ads at Wikipedia does not have a pronunciation guide, but it is a a mythical monster from uh, Ghana. So it's an African monster that who's like a vampiric type creature it takes the form of a firefly and it like messes with people and lures them and then like uh, controls them. So like, I think they did a really good job of this and many other things in Everborn, honestly, but uh, of mining uh, a lot of really creative and cool monsters from around the world. So, Herman, tell us a, a non-lore thing about this model. So Jeff is right for all the wrong reasons. I think <laughs> we did we did like the uh, the light burr, 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 burr horn on like this whole podcast. Well, and I, I don't Herman know if it's like he, he's he's right for the wrong reasons or he's wrong for the right reasons. But he, the thing is, is that I love the Adzi. I absolutely love the Adzi. I don't know what the AIDS is. But I, I use the ads a lot. You've with, got the aids. Shut up. I use it a lot with Marcus. I think it's fantastic with Marcus. I love that you can put the mutations on it. It does so much work. He's absolutely right about the burning and all of that. The problem is, in my opinion, when you shuffle over to Zoraida, there's just so much better models that compete with him. And she does not have the defensive upgrades that Marcus can put on him to help him stay alive in that threat band that he's existing in. He's too easy to remove, specifically in Swamp Fiend. See, this tells me that uh, when you're playing Zoraida, you have a very good opportunity to isolate models. Uh, particularly enemy models, and get them out on an island by themselves where you can bring in uh, models that would typically, you'd be concerned about them uh, jumping in the middle of the fray. Well, they don't have to do that when you're playing against the Rida. Uh The other thing to note is that when you have a model that is kind of forward and into the fray, uh, particularly uh, the Groot Slang, uh, there's a thing that some people do on turn one where the Groot Slang jumps to the middle of the board uh, and then Zoraida can use the Groot Slang to start obeying models on turn one. Uh, but the the aides can uh, fly along the edges with Zoraida using it as a node uh, to continue her attacks. But it it can hold its own in a fight, and it only costs seven. So it, it, uh, in general, it's a very good model for its cost. Well, one, I'd like to point out, when have you ever seen me leave my brick? Like, we play a lot, and I just I love my little brick. You're not You're not pulling that apart. <laughs> but two, like the thing is, is that you're including these Sillerids. You you have a lot of these stealth models and then with really good defenses. And then you have this Adzi, which he has no defensive tech on him. And he's just hanging out there. He is literally the easiest thing for your opponent to attack. And that's why he goes down so quickly. Like So let, let, let me uh, throw out a scenario for you in your brick. Um, theoretically. And in this scenario, I know it's going to die at some point. Uh, but you have your brick where you have a bunch of models all clumped up together. And it jumps over, because it's fast enough to do so, into the middle of uh, that uh, brick of yours, uh, pulses out burning into a three-inch pulse around it, usually hitting, uh, if you're playing in a brick style, somewhere around like six models, and putting burning on all of them. Now, this is where the, you knowing your opponent's crew comes into play. You don't want to do that if you know they have condition removal. But I spent seven soul stones to do if this happens on turn two, say, uh, and I got it on burning on six models because uh, with the tome trigger, they don't get a resist for it. They just get burning. Uh, so from that point on, I six damage per turn for the next 
uh, four turns. You're looking at 24 damage uh, done to models spread out. I mean, uh, I only paid seven soul stones for this thing. And uh, if you do that towards the end of the turn or Zoraida brings it in, it can still activate once you hit it in order to get its life back up from its venomous strike. So I, I know looking at it at face value, it doesn't seem like it has a lot of defensive tech, but unless you can take it out in one turn, it can heal itself back up. My point is, is that you do take it out in one turn. And then it, like, if you look at our counterplay section, the first thing I wrote for Zoraida is bring condition removal. Unfortunately, every single model has condition removal against burning. You're literally giving my enslaved Nephilim a job. He doesn't have anything else to do. I will say that is, and just we've harped on this before, but a good reminder to folks that the general action assist exists and it is there to ruin your burning dealing enemies plans of giving you burning. Um, I rare, it rarely comes up, but when it does, uh, like in, in a, a game that I played a couple of weeks ago where I set everyone on fire with Draken Troopers. And my opponent was like, cool, I assist my guys and they're not burning. Um, but it made me I, sad. I'm glad that you brought that up because, well, first of all, uh, the uh, Adzi uh, does have defensive tech. If a model has burning and it's attacking it, it gets positive flips uh, plus the penetrating stench of discard a card or you gain stun. Uh, and the distracted, if you actually try get, make a move within two inches of it, those those are all very good things. But you know they're not hard defenses. Uh, aside from this, um, if you're taking an action. Uh, I already mentioned this earlier in the podcast. If you're taking an action to remove burning, uh, to pat it out, and you're taking actions in order to try to take the, out this uh, this adzi that's in the middle of your crew, you are doing exactly what I want you to do. My crew is very AP efficient, and Zoraida makes them even more so. So if you're wasting actions to pat out burning uh, that I've put on, out onto six models, you've just, uh, like... I mean, are you going to do that to all six of those models? Because now you're down quite a bit of AP where I can you quite literally use my own models and your models to achieve the goals that I'm looking for. So, uh, you know, you, you say that you're not high on the pick, but there's not really a good option for you to get around this model. Oh, I mean, at some point we do have to pull the plug on the argument, but I'm just going to say I play guild. You're assuming that my actions are valuable. Well, that's, that's a problem with your crew. <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, yeah. I, I already mentioned the Groot Slang. Uh, the Groot Slang is, uh, once again, awesome. just just so you know, a lot of these models are really good with Marcus as well because he can uh, tack on yeah, defensive tech yeah, uh, to, to these things. Uh, we'll do that in another episode where we cover Marcus. But uh, the Groot Slang is very good at getting around the board. It's also very good at making markers when it wants to. Uh, and unless your opponent is actually getting rid of those markers, the Groot Slang can be where it wants, when it wants. Uh, and it's... Uh, it's a powerful model. Uh, it can give out slow when it uh, on an attack that's a two inch range, and uh, in general, it just helps to reinforce that AP efficiency uh, that you have uh, with the Zoraida crew. Um, putting out slow is always a good thing on an attack that does damage, and it's a guaranteed slow. Um, aside from that. Just going into things like uh, death beds and uh, research mission, having marker generation is awesome. So the Groot Slang uh, is not an always hire, but uh, as a sometimes hire, particularly if I see a writer or some model that I know is very crucial to uh, the enemy team, like as an example, Dashel, um, one of the things that's fun to do is popping uh, the Groot Slang within range where I can obey one of your models to charge that uh would dispatcher and uh, kill it in the first turn, depending on how things set up. Uh, things like that are a lot of fun, um, particularly uh, like a lot of defenses don't matter when it's your own models that are hitting them. Uh, so uh, things like terrifying uh, those uh, manipulative, those things don't actually go off when your own models are hitting you. So uh, that's one of the big things why Zoraida, like knowing the enemy crew and knowing your crew is very important. Come on, get to the best model in her crew. All right, what is it? The Salorid? No, it's the first mate. We already covered the Salorids. There we go. First mate. Not He's the second so mate. He is the first mate. The first mate's so good, even after the nerf. I, it's still he strong. used to be one of the best models in the game. After the nerf, uh, 
Uh, still he's, good. He's still good. Uh, he accomplishes the same things that Salords do, but he provides hitting power with it. Um, he is a very good model. Um, unfortunately, this is just me. Uh, I don't like models. I like models to have a purpose and he's kind of very broad in his purpose of he has, he's a scheme runner that's very expensive or he's a beater that's not as good as other beaters and he can do both, which is great. But uh, I don't, I don't, in the past, I took him in pretty much every game. Now, after his nerf, uh, I, I'll, I'll s- settle on somewhere around like 40 to 50% with him. Okay. Herman, do you disagree? I mean, I think he's better than Jeff is giving him credit for, for sure. And I also disagree with the um, the role thing, is you have a model who can fit either role. It's kind of like uh, McTavish. McTavish has a great melee, and he has a great range. He can do both. And you're playing with this Sarita, and what she does is she gives you options. She gives you option after option after option with fast, with double obeys. So you benefit so much more from her from having models that can fill these multiple roles. So, I mean, specifically, like generally speaking in tabletop gaming, a specialist is better than a generalist, and that's kind of what you want to pick. But in this particular master with this particular keyword, having someone who can do both things is phenomenal, and it gives you the flexibility that you want. That's why he's, again, the first mate. Yeah, I'm going to have to go with Herman on that Um, because you do have so many options. It also has, I mean, he's got stealth also, so he's hard to take down from range. He's got butterfly jump, which is the most annoying ability in Malfo, in my opinion. Um, He's just got a lot going on for him. Um, But but yeah, you mentioned McTavish, uh, and maybe Herman, let's go to you on this one. What are your thoughts on McTavish in this keyword? I mean, he's not an always take, but he gives you what you want, and that's that versatility. He's got the min three beater. He actually has puncture, which is a fantastic trigger. Um, He's a henchman, so he can stone for that trigger as well. He's got that 14-inch gun, so he can start putting out a lot of pressure very early. A lot of everything else in Zoraida is melee focused, so you're having to do the leaping. You're having to spend AP to close the distance. Whereas with McTavish, he gets the free walk and free three inches every turn. And you've got that 14-inch gun. You're applying pressure early. You're applying pressure often. And you're giving the rest of your stuff the time it needs. And so I think that's that's what makes him such a good pressure piece. I rarely take McTavish in third edition. <laughs> and the reason why is because his gun is a stat five. Uh, when I'm paying nine soul stones for a model, uh, I'd like to guarantee that they're actually going to hit, and a stat five doesn't do that for me. His melee attack is very good. The problem is I now have to have McTavish in melee, uh, which isn't necessarily a place that I want uh, this model to be. And unfortunately, because I played McTavish in second edition, in third edition, Gator Snack became significantly worse than what it was, uh, where in the past he was able to get off three shots because of it. Now he can't do that anymore, which uh, is very unfortunate. Um, I mean, let, let's be honest. It was, it was oppressive in second edition. Like He was very good, but it was oppressive. <laughs> Uh, I agree, and that's one of the, it's. It's probably a hangover from going from second edition to third edition, where I'm not a huge fan of McTavish. Between his uh, his gun losing a stat and him not being able to take a third shot with the gun, uh, he didn't gain a whole lot in the transition and just lost a lot of things. And uh, when I'm looking for action efficiency with Zoraida multiplying uh, what I'm able to put out. Uh, the range from the gun is always something that's helpful. The 14 inch range is awesome, particularly because Neverborn don't have a whole lot of ranged options. But uh, whenever I do like an obey, I want him to be able to hit. And it's just, it seems more often than not, I miss with McTavish. And uh, whenever I put him in a game, I usually look at it. I'm like, uh, like those nine soul stones could have been better spent somewhere else. All right. Fair enough. Um, are there any other models that you see as your core crew? As the core, no. But <laughs> I have to mention the bastard stepchild of this whole keyword in the spawn mother. Did you really have to mention her? I do, because 
I don't, I'm not going to lie and say that I take the Spawn Mother a lot. However, the Spawn Mother is actually a mini Nakima. And I can explain that. But because of her ability of a Mother's Rage, which is on all the time, when any Swamp Fiend dies around her, she gets to immediately make a charge and try to attack the thing that killed that Swamp Fiend. Uh, she's also able to make gups. Gups aren't very good. Uh, they're literally only there to be made and go tie up opponents, uh, and they're not even good at that. Uh, but she herself has a respectable damage track of 236 with an infect trigger built in. She also has that puncture trigger, and being able to get off free, uh, she's fast, movement six, with ambush, and uh, putting out eggs where she just gets free summons from the Gups is pretty good in and of itself. Now, it, it provides random healing where if you uh, remove the egg markers, you can also heal. Um, but she, I think she's better than a lot of people give her credit for. Um, I don't, I'm not going to lie and tell you that you should take her in every game. Uh, but if you play around with her, particularly with the way they've changed summoning, where summoning is a lot better to just make models to go tie up your opponent, she's very good at making models to go tie up opponents. Uh, so don't, try, don't overlook the Spawn Mother, uh, particularly if you're playing in a, a game where you are bringing models that can hand out focus. She can put out surprising amounts of damage. All right. Um, so who is who is out of the running in the keyword? I've not heard any mention of our friends, the the lesser Adzi, the Will-O-Wisp, uh, or the Bayou Gators, or the Wald Geist. Uh, I don't take Bayou Gators. Uh, I have actually never hired a Bayou Gator. Um, I, somebody else will have to talk about that, whether they're good or not. It's, I've just never done it. Um, Will-O-Wisps are interesting in a scheme runner uh, capacity, the problem is, and they are good in, for uh, other people, uh, particularly like things like Marcus, where he can uh, just make a really fast scheme runner. Unfortunately, because the Silords exist, I don't think they're uh, they're good in a scheme runner for Zoraida. Uh, and I, out of the, I don't even know how many games that I've played uh, with Zoraida, I have never gotten one of these things to grow ever. It's, it's it just never happened. Uh, you technically only have to be next to a model that kills an enforcer. Uh, or you have to be next to an, uh, an, enf- an enforcer that dies in order to grow. It's just it's not something that I've ever actually had happened. Uh, uh, so the but the Willow Wisps lore is good and uh, just as always with the uh, if you charge and injure or if you move and injure move anywhere within two of them you get distracted. Uh, you know they're they're fun little uh, texts, but um, some people swear by them. I'm not a swear by them type of person. Sorry, so, what what is what are you saying about enforcers? They if you. Uh, they have a grow mechanic where they can grow it's into bloody an, transformation. Yeah, where they can grow into an uh, adzi um, if a they non minion model is killed near them. Yeah, sorry, it's a non minion model. I immediately default to enforcer because uh, you know henchmen and masters dying next to them is probably not going to happen if the enforcer doesn't. But but um, I mean the reason why Jeff never takes the will the wisps is because he's not using the manga manga curse the way that the designers intended to. So if you bring a will of the wisps and then you use the voodoo doll in order to actually make that attachment onto a model, then with one AP, you can give it stun distracted and slow uh, using distracting illusion. That's, that's the purpose of taking them. Whether or not that's useful is part of your game plan. Hmm. Well, that's a fair point. And with distracted being a little better in GG two, maybe it's got, yeah, I mean, you can use it to shut down like a 10, 10 soul stone beater very quickly. Uh, so the Bayou Gators, uh, they suffer from being a five cost model and they die like a five cost model, but they're weirdly good in the sense that they're ruthless, stealth, have flurry, and built in puncture. So they're actually a weirdly good five soul stone model. So you shouldn't hate on them. The problem I think is that you got everything else going on and they just get pushed out. I mean, I have toyed with an idea of making a, a stealth list where you take a lot of models that have stealth and you force your enemy to come to you. And gators do have stealth, which is, is, is you know, it's kind of cool. But I don't, 
I don't know. Well, you, they, they suffer from that stat five thing. They are five, so they're not cheap. Uh, it, I don't. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's not. It's something that I've never actually hired, and I don't see them used very often either. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen them used in a game. So, uh, but I don't play a lot of people that play Bayou either. So, so that's a good point. So we talked about all right. So to recap, your core crew. For Jeff, it's the somewhat controversial bad juju pick. Then not controversial. Herman's just dumb. Uh, then it's not controversial. One, Jeff's just wrong. <laughs> one or I think that's the definition of controversy. Um, so one or two adsies. Uh, you can only bring one. Uh, one. I, I, yeah. One of those. Uh, then maybe a Groot slang. Right, like that's that's like the core, and then it's season to taste with other cool models. Is that? I'd the... say first mate makes it in a lot, and then probably an out of keyword beater makes it in a lot. Yeah, yeah, out of keyword beaters are a, a big thing uh, because she just makes uh, just the way the Zoraida works. She makes good things better, and yeah. if you're bringing a, an out of keyword model and you can make it make take more actions, that just makes the out of keyword model even better. Yep. Um, and is that, is that Hinamatsu? Is that Hooded Rider? Is that what? Yes, to the both things that you just said. Yeah. It depends on the, the scenario. Because yeah. the nice thing with Hooded Rider is he has Ride With Me, so he can also be as a ride a taxi. I do. It is, it is handy. Um, so, Herman, can you comment on the Bayou side of the equation? Is it pretty much the same, or are there any... Uh, so hopefully Bayou people don't light me up. I'm not a Bayou player. I'm a Bayou opponent. Um, so you see the Silurids are... If you're playing Zoraida, you are taking the Silurids. That You need to. That is her game plan. Then you've got First Mate in there. People take Bad Juju because he comes in the box, and they're wrong. Um, you're you wrong. See a, <laughs> see a lot of um, one to two bokers. And then you've got... Kind of you can start going out of keyword after that. Uh, Gracie is always a popular pick in Bayou. Because she's got the armor, she's got the ride with me. She's kind of a bit of a tank. Um, they don't have like Hinamatsu and Bayou. Instead, they have Francois. So he's a henchman. He's got flurry. He's got built-in crit strike. So I think he starts at base two, goes up to three, and then with a stone and a ram, you can get up to min five damage if you want. Then he's also stat seven with um, bigger they are, and then he gets the shielded from flinch. So he's really effing annoying. Uh, one that I haven't seen that I think people should consider is actually the Whiskey Golem because he brings in that armor two, but he's defense six. He's like a bad juju, but better in every respect. He's also min three. He has onslaught, so he can get more than one attack. And then he has nimble, so he's actually very fast too. So it's basically like you're getting bad juju, but better in every single aspect. Did, did you just say that about Lenny? No, I said that about a Whiskey Golem. Oh, uh, whiskey golem. Oh, Lenny okay. was kind of my reach when I was poking around because it's just he gets plus one to duels when he's obeyed, but it, all his stats are really low, so it's kind of. Wait, does he have defense three? No, he's, he's better than bad juju. No, you shut your face. <laughs> so I, I I will say when I'm, it, my crew is designed to accomplish my uh, strats and schemes usually, and what I because I'm not saying that. Uh, like Gracie, Francois, the Whiskey Golem, like these are all really good models. And, uh, you know, when we look at the models that you can bring out a keyword for Neverborn that would actually fit in well here, um, the Carver's not a good idea. Thune's not a good idea. They're, they're just, uh, Hayridden can work uh, because of how much damage he can put out. Uh, so that that's an idea that you can bring in. But you're looking at usually your enforcers. And with your enforcers, you're looking at the Hooded Rider and you're looking at... Uh, the or Hinamatsu, which is a, a henchman. I mean, those are those are pretty much your, your go tos when you're going out a keyword with them. So because I come from a Neverborn perspective, it's less important. Like I design my crew based on how to accomplish my strats and schemes, and I look at your crew to find out what I can do to screw with your crew, as opposed to what I can do with my crew to make my crew better. Usually, so just right off the bat, using Zoraida to completely mess up your game plan. Uh, I can't tell you how many times opponents I've sniffed out 
uh, somebody having claim jump and just made that person walk to the other end of the board. And like, there's, there's not a whole lot that can be done about it because of how good her obeys actually are. Yeah. I actually don't take claim jump against her. But one thing to also bear in mind when you're comparing and contrasting Neverborn and Bayou is Bayou does not have the puppet factory that Neverborn has. They don't have Widow Weaver. They don't have Vesselisa. So they don't have access to a lot of those things. It changes the play style. Yeah, and that's a, that's a good point that Herman's bringing up. Like, I don't need to hire in uh, stat or men three beaters into my crew because every turn I can make a stitch that does men three uh, to you. Like, it's not... They're, and they're throwaway units for me that I literally get for free. I mean, I have to use a card to bring it out sometimes, but it's it's not that big. Of, like, beaters aren't something that I'm really starving for with uh, with Zoraida. I don't really need to bring them along. Uh, and uh, except for uh, my bad juju. Shut, the, shut up, Herman. Okay. Well, uh, there you have the general crew build. Um, I think the, last, the only last thing we want to cover is... How the heck do you fight against this thing? Um, do you all want to throw to a break or just jump right into it? I'll just power through. All right, let's do it. So you are you sit down at the table. Your opponent declares Zoraida, or in, in your case, you are declaring Zoraida, right? Um, and if I'm sitting here against Zoraida, I'm like, ah, crap. Like, all my stuff's going to get obeyed places. I'm going to have to attack my own guys. Like there's all sorts of annoying stuff that's going to happen to mess with my game plan. What should I do when I face off against Zoraida? Don't put your big beater next to something that's valuable in your crew. That's probably not a good idea because uh, you're going to find your own guy beating the hell out of you. That's going to happen no matter what. (laughs) Yeah, you You can charge. I mean, you're going to be within five inches, six inches. No, I, uh, Josh has been smart, and uh, he'll take his really large beater uh, or his two beaters and put them on one flank while his other key piece that he needs is off on the other flank where they're nowhere near each other. Uh, and then you can't really capitalize on that very well. Um, I wouldn't recommend taking riders against Zoraida because she can use those things better than you can. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's probably not a good idea. But the thing that I hate the most is hostile work environment. Yo, fuck that ability. Like, I really hate hostile work environment to the point that I can't even tell you how annoying that ability is. Does it make I, you hostile? It does. It, <laughs> it, it definitely does. Um, I can still mess with your crew. The problem is I can't mess with my crew anymore within that bubble. And that's just, like, it's not fun getting one of my models. Like, the game plan changes completely. Uh, and my crew changes out completely if hostile work environment is a, uh, a thing because I won't take things like an uh, Adzi or uh, Bad Juju because I don't get any bonus benefits from having them around. I can't make them continue to attack, and I'll probably uh, switch my crew up to where I take a lot of smaller models, lean on the puppet factory where I'm getting more uh, of the the stitched and more of these puppets out, uh, and kind of going that route, because if I'm not getting extra actions from the, the good uh, models in her keyword, they feel a little over cost for what they do. Uh, so it that'll completely change how I play if I'm an, unable to obey my own models. Yeah. And I mean, and that's one of the things I actually had listed down for dealing with her because my things were bring some condition removal. She does put out the stuns just on her own and then just all the other various conditions that she can throw out. There's a lot of, I believe poison and the keyword, things like that. Uh, ditch the rider, leave him at home. Uh, don't stack focus. Same reason as the rider. She'll just use her focus against you. It's very not fun. Um, but then how are you how are you looking to handle obey and that's things like do not take claim jump because she will walk you away do not take things that require you to be standing in a certain area because you will not be able to stand there conversely your master cannot be obeyed take two that's something to do or if you're playing against claim jump park your master's butt right on that claim jump spot so that way he can't get claim jump either uh stealth she is still affected by stealth, so you can stealth her back. Like if you're playing, um, what, 10 Thunders? I don't know if Ninja Training got that removed or not with the nerf. I wasn't paying attention. Sorry, guys. Um, but then, like, I play a lot of guild. So I have crowd control on the emissary. He can't take actions within six inches of me. I've got crowd control on that useless critter with Hoffman. He can't take actions within six inches of it. Unyielding. You can't obey those models. 
Uh, if you can stun Zoraida at range, she really doesn't like to be stunned because that turns off her double um, efficiency. She doesn't get the fast on her obey anymore. She doesn't get the double AP on her obeys anymore. She really doesn't like to be stunned, so you can put pressure on her that way. Uh, we already talked about kind of your hand control, how you want to cheat against her and deal with her ability. You want to bring in models that draw a lot of cards. And then you have to you have to have to have a plan for handling the Sillards. They are the stealth butterfly jump guys. They are the key to her scoring points. And so you're looking at things that have ways to move other than charging in. That's nimble. That's fly with me, ride with me, ambush. Something where you can get in on them, take the swing. They butter jump away, butterfly jump away. You get that extra swing on them. So that way you're not losing out because of that stealth, because of that extra movement. So just to build on two things there. Uh, one, yes, uh, the stealth is still a thing on Train Ninja uh, if you're a minion. You can get it. That's the uh, the minion only part of that Ten Thunders upgrade. And two is that with Claim Jump, um, Claim Jump is you have to select a non-leader model, whereas Obey is a non-master model. So you actually, if the tournament or event or the game you're playing supports uh, having multiple masters, you can actually Ooh, hire a master and make them your claim jump model and put them in the middle and be like, screw you. I'm putting my giant hard to shift guy there. Boo. I I actually wanted to touch on something that Herman said, and this kind of goes into, uh, in order to play Zoraida effectively, you have to know how to use your obey. And when Herman said things like, you have to have a plan to uh, take out Salords, I can't tell you how many games uh, I have played where I have a Salord going back for breakthrough, and Zoraida's kind of, she's not never really that far up the board, but she uh, can use her own models to obey through. And somebody will go into melee to kill that Salord uh, that's in position to score, and or to drop a ski mark or whatever I needed to do. So they run over, they kill the Salurid, and then I just look over and say, okay, I'm going to activate Zoraida. I'm going to obey you to drop my ski marker. Thanks. Like, you've, like, you have to know how to get around these things, uh, and that leads to another good point. Um, they actually because of how powerful Zoraida is with these obeys. And when you get players that are really good, that uh, player, they actually had to change the wording on some of these strats to where uh, Zoraida can no longer obey your models to move the strategy markers. And a lot of these uh, strats uh, in such a way that if, if you, a friendly controlled model is a model that was hired within your crew that you control. So when a strat says that a friendly controlled model can interact with a strategy marker, when you obey them, they are not friendly controlled models. They are still an enemy model, and just because you are obeying them does not make them your model. So they change the wording on things to where Zoraida cannot do that anymore because of how oppressive uh, she was uh, in the beginning of of Gaining Grounds uh, 0 and I think 1. but that being said, you should always look outside the box uh, for using obeys, uh, not just the stuff like using all the writer's tokens, using an enemy's focus against them, but uh, other things like um, uh, Zoraida is one of the few things that I was able to accomplish. What was that absolute horrible scheme? Um, runic binding. Zoraida could actually do runic binding. She could place down a... Uh, a scheme, or she could in one turn she could put place down a scheme marker, and then obey two different models at two other points to put down scheme markers in the last turn, and actually get runic binding herself, uh, just within the last activation of the game. Uh, she is very good at manipulating uh, models and pieces on the board in ways that are advantageous to her. But you have to go into it with a game plan of knowing what you're going to do and be able to adjust on the fly based on where models are moving to. So it's a very fluid gameplay and you need to be able to adapt and uh, overcome what your opponent's doing. And if all else fails, your opponent is moving a model in a direction for a reason. 
if you take that model and you shove it back to where it was or you move it to in a completely different spot, there's a good chance you are messing up your opponent's game plan and now your opponent has to rethink what they're doing. And Zoraida can do this uh, to multiple models in a turn. So she is uh, not only in accomplishing your strats and schemes, you also need to constantly be thinking about what strats and schemes your opponent has and how you're going to disrupt those. One, leave Rikert alone. He's a saint. And two, that's exactly why when you're playing into her, try to not take positioning-based schemes if at all possible because they will they're going to touch your stuff it's going it's going to happen and it's not a fun feeling or play 10 thunders and take a bunch of models with laugh off and laugh off when you prevent all that and don't forget her range uh she can do these things from uh in some cases 24 inches away uh she can put on poisoned fate from uh, 18 inches away onto your master uh like these are things like the best thing about zoraida is she can shift what she wants to do uh on a whim and whatever new thing has popped up you can adjust uh if your mat if their master decided that uh, he wanted to wade into the fray uh, and you have some models that are close by, put Poison Fate on it and go after that master because I guarantee if Poison Fate is on a master and you still have two or three models left to go, that master is going to die. Like it, It's just going to take so much damage between should I cheat this and not get hit or should I take just an automatic two damage because I cheated it. It's, it, it is an amazing ability. Yeah, and one of the other things is when you talk about her flexibility – with uh, in War Machine, we call them arc nodes, where she can use her other guys to cast her, um, her spells. The more of her models that you kill quickly, the less flexibility she has. So if you can take those Silurids out, you know, quickly take something that's got like a six on the max end, focus and do the single attack and kill it. Uh, if you can remove those layer markers from the Groot Slank so he can't teleport over to that side of the board, the more you can restrict her movement, the more you can restrict her models, the easier time you'll have in the long run. That's very true, and something else that you need to keep in, keep in mind if you are a Zoraida player is AP is a resource in this game, and that's why people overlook the Spawn Mother, but the Spawn Mother can make quite a bit of gups uh, throughout the game, and gups are Swamp Fiends. They can be used as what Herman calls as an Arc Node, uh, but if your opponent is taking time out of it uh, and using AP to try to kill the, these gups, they're going to die. They're not that you can't keep them alive very well, but it usually takes uh, a scheme runner two, maybe three hits to take out a gup. And that's AP that they're not using to accomplish what they want. And between that and you messing with their game plans to begin with, just utilize this. And if you can make the other opponent waste AP taking out things that you ultimately don't care about, it's a win for you. And then one of the other things that can actually be very helpful is that in order to use um, Eyes in the Night, she has to have line of sight. So if you're bringing in the Carrion Emissary, if you're bringing in Zip, you drop those pianos, you drop those coffins, you drop ice pillar markers, you block line of sight, she cannot use that model anymore or she has to use her own AP to move. Uh, conversely, if you're charging, like say you have a mature Nephilim or like a young Nephilim, charge to the other side of the Silurid so that you're in between her and the Silurid. She cannot see it anymore. She or it is using some AP to get out of that way. You can cost her efficiency in that method too. Yeah, that's that's actually a really good point. I hate having to move on Zoraida. I, it, it is the most, it, she is, all of her abilities and everything she does it, are so good that having to actually walk or move Zoraida on her own willpower is like, that's one of the reasons why you bring things like the Hooded Rider so that he, like his action, even though he's a 12 Soulstone model is not as good as what Zoraida can do. So having him move, and it's a bonus action for him, but having other models, particularly like uh, things like the Adzi or the Will-O-Wisp that can lure Zoraida forward where she doesn't have to walk and all of her AP can go towards you furthering your own game plan or ruining your opponents is uh, a ph phenomenal game plan. And if you can stop that from happening, that's uh, th like any AP you can waste from Zoraida is wor well worth you doing. All right. Well, and there we have it. Are there any, any other closing thoughts on Zoraida? I will mention one thing. You notice when we said counters to Zoraida, uh, we didn't mention going after Zoraida and trying to kill her. 
in most instances, that is not a good idea uh, because of her regret trigger and because of her uh, ability where if you, uh, first of all, uh, we already talked about uh, poison fate, but she also has, if you cheat within her line of sight, she gets to look at your next card and choose to discard it or put it back. If you decide to go all in on Zoraida, uh, with a melee character, that's just a really dumb idea to begin with. She's usually not going to position herself in a way that your ranged people can get to her. Uh, but uh, even if you manage to pull it off to where you've got uh, a great chance at actually taking Zoraida out between her soul stones and being able to look at your next card. And if it's a high card, discarding it when you cheat fate, uh, it's, she's very difficult to, I'm, she's not impossible to kill, but she has ways of making it very difficult for you to accomplish it. So just be wary of that. Uh, it's usually not a good idea to go running after Zoraida. And when an opponent usually tries to do that, that's when I'll shift over and I'll bring the voodoo doll out. And the voodoo doll will hem the, the model that's coming in on me. And then unless you're coming with a full force attack, if you're bringing one model, that model's going to die. It's uh, like you just have too much stacked against you with that that one model to be able to take Zoraida out. So just be wary of this. It's not usually a good pl- game plan to just charge head first into her. I'll diverge from you slightly here where you definitely should not charge head first into her, but shooting her is fair game and you yeah, can put some pressure absolutely. on her there. Uh, yeah. If you, if you can manage uh, the smart Zoraida player is not going to leave her within firing uh, lines because she can use the, uh, the Swamp Fiends as uh, nodes to bounce off of. But if you can manage to, if you have things like run and gun where you can charge and get a shot off while doing your movement, uh, take, taking pot shots at her from range is, is a very good idea. Uh, the Just be wary that if you can see Zoraida, she can also see you. And if you're taking somebody like Fuhatsu, uh, if you don't manage to take Zoraida out, uh, she's going to make your Fuhatsu take one of your things out very quickly. So just be aware of that. All right. Well, there you have it. Um, so listeners, let us know when we post this episode on, on The Weird Place what you think. Uh, are you going to check out Mama Z? Give her a little love. Uh, play a game with her. And, uh, and also let us know again about our, uh, our speed stress segment. So we'll be back with you in your feed sometime soon. Uh, we may be on a slight break uh, just due to summer schedules, but we'll be back as soon as possible with another exciting episode of the Capital City Crew Podcast. Until then, take care. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Capital City Crew Podcast. We hope you tune in next time.